<laughs> Boy, that got you quiet, didn't it? Hey, welcome to the bull session. Hey, you have a question? Oh, okay. Okay. You got crutches? What'd you do? What? Twisted your ankle. That's a rarity down here. That's a rarity. And you got crutches? All right, this is a chance for you all to ask questions to any of the pros. Uh, as you know, the whole week is a bull session, but there's some questions that you may want to really hear the true story, and believe me, these guys will give you the absolute facts of exactly what happened. Um, this is a mixed audience, guys. Okay. So who would like to ask the first question? All right, thank you very much. Food's in the back. <laughs> Did I say, did you have a question? Does anyone, you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Is this a question for Rodney? Yeah, yeah. What is your question? The question was, Rodney, come here. Did you break anything when you ran into the wall? No, I did not. I bit my tongue, and I could not eat food for the rest of the night. So, otherwise, that young lady, I didn't break anything. I just bit my tongue. All righty, who's next? John Stearns has a question. I'd like to ask Edgardo Alfonso, what was it like playing second base with uh, Ray Ordonez? Edgardo, the two of you together. What was it like? Uh, crazy Ray Ordonez. Everybody know him, right? It was uh, exciting, uh, really exciting. Uh, I think that guy was unbelievable playing uh, shortstop. He got tremendous talent, and uh, I always had to be aware what he gonna do, you know? And then, uh, I mean, I really enjoy it. Uh, that's something that uh, I was playing right next to him, and every time he made a spe spectacular play, I had to watch him. I mean, I had to, I had to you know, exciting too, got exciting. But I think it was a tremendous shortstop, and then uh, I think we did a pretty good combination. All right, next question. Yes, in the back. Anyone on the panel on my Kiner's Corner, uh, you get, when you're really drinking beer there and uh, tell me, uh, did they pay you a little something to go on Kiner's Corner? Who's this question for? Anybody that went on the show. All right, anybody that went on Kiner's Corner, is it true that in those cups that were covered up, there was beer? <laughs> and did, yeah, did they, um, did they pay us anything for being on there? Yeah, I think there were, you got points towards gifts, I think. You got a gift. Is there anybody here that Ralph got their name right? No? Okay. What was in the cups? Um, soda. That's why it's called a bull session. Hey, I, you know, look, I don't, we never took any beer in there. We, we, we drank beer in the clubhouse. Oh. <laughs> Duffy? What? <laughs> Who, me? Uh, uh, soda. 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 <laughs> there you have it, the honest truth. Oh, wait a minute. Al Jackson? Sometimes we got certificates for the case of beer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, anybody? John's got another question. Yeah, I'd like to ask Doc Gooden, what was his best pitch the f when he first came up? The fastball or his big overhand breaking ball from the right side? Doc, tell me about that 24-4 and four season. The 24-4 and four season was very special. Uh, there's no secret that I had my career year having Gary Carter as my catcher that year. Um, but it, 
was a season where um, after my first year in 84, you know, I finished 17 and 9, had a good year, uh, got a lot of experience for the year, and coming into the next season, you know, we had a great team, and like I said, we added Gary Carr that year, and uh, from the get-go, every game, you just felt like you was totally locked in, uh, the games that I didn't feel like I had my best stuff, uh, Gary made me believe I did, and he was the type of guy, even when he had a big lead, he wanted the best out of me, and he was one of those guys where if I wouldn't give him, or he thought I wouldn't give him my all, he'll let me know. He was the type of guy to get in your face if you had to be. It was just a special year, and then you guys, the fans, uh, brought a lot of energy to me. You know, when you get two strikes, you guys were standing up, clapping, wanting to strike out, and I fed off of that. It was just a great time and a special year for myself. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yes. What was it like to play for Bobby V? Who wants it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I liked playing for Bobby V because he's a guy that liked uh, a lot of the attention on himself. And it let us relax and play our game as a player. So you didn't have to worry about it. A lot of times he would take the heat. Um, but, he, you know, as much as I liked him, he kind of liked to call the shots, too. He didn't like it if you hit somebody and he didn't call the shots. <laughs> so, but I, I really enjoyed it, and I think he's one of, the, uh, one of the reasons I had the career that I had. And I'm thankful for that. Okay. All right, yes. Yes, but because all the guys who choke up in English. Porque la persona que choque la Because the guy who choke up don't make any money. The guy who hit home runs make the money. Good answer. Yes, free. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to the organization that I got invited this year. Um, I appreciate it. Anyway, you know, a lot of people, you know, I, it's funny, you know, obviously I thought to probably the greatest catcher ever played. Sorry, John, you weren't the guy. But anyway. <laughs> What a great time in New York. Oh, what a great time. The fans, unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable. You know, I've played with the Phillies, the Braves. Yeah, uh, I, I know, but, you know, someone's got to make some money. You know what I mean? I, I mean? Anyways, what a great time in New York. There, there's nothing better. I mean, I will, I will end up living in New York once my kids leave the house. You know, me and my wife already promised. You know, we promised each other we're going to make it happen. Anyway. A lot of people talk about the home run, and you know it. it, it you know, sometimes dog, you know, the sun shines on dog's ass once in a while. You know what I mean? And that's what happened that day. Uh, I think we all talked about during the hitting uh, clinic uh, that could easily have been the go. That was my greatest moment, isn't it? To be honest with you, I mean, it was great. But starting game one, the Subway Series, to have the confidence of my staff to allow me to do that. I mean, that was incredible because. You know, we have the pregame workouts, you know, a couple of days before, it's media day. And Bobby V comes in and he said, dude, you're starting game one. I'm like, dude, no way. I thought he was joking. I thought it was, a, you know, one of these jokes, you know what I mean? I was, I was looking for the video camera, and they're like, they're trying to play a joke on me. But to start game one in the World Series, you know, for all the trials and tribulations I went through my career was amazing. Um, and that's what, that's, that was my most memorable moment. I appreciate it. I have this question for anybody who has an opinion. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. Why hasn't uh, 
uh, uh, first of all, do you think that Gil Hodges will ever get into the Hall of Fame? And if not, or why not? Why is he not there now? Gil Hodges. <laughs> the, uh, the question was, why, uh, or do we think Gil Hodges should get in the Hall of Fame? And if we do, why he should? And if we don't, why shouldn't he? All right. Hold on to that, and when Piggy gets here, and we got about 45 minutes to kill, we'll let him answer. Okay. okay. Who? Doc, you had a question. Did you read about yourself in the paper, or did you ignore it? All uh, right. AY will handle it. Doc, did you actually think I wanted to read about 27 losses? <laughs> huh? I wouldn't dare pick up a paper at that time. Believe me. It's like, like most of them said, if, if they thought it was pretty, if you had a good game, you didn't mind reading it. If it was a bad game, you probably didn't read it. Yes, ma'am. Will Sternsey tell the Nakahoma story for the new people that are here? Dude? Uh oh. I think Dwight needs to tell that one. I think what happened was, uh, I think it was 1985. <laughs> but the thing was, you know, Stern is a good guy. We always talked about other sports and things we did as kids and growing up in high school. He talked about what a great defensive bike he was. And he just had something against Nakahoma. You guys know who Nakahoma was, right? So we was there for a three-game series. And the first day, you know, he, after the anthem, he does his, you know, his TP thing. And then he runs to the left field and gets his TP. And, Stern says, one day I'm going to get him. <laughs> so, so we didn't know he meant he's going to tackle him. So the next day, you know, he does his thing after the anthem. He's running to left field and fans are cheering. And they go Stern from the third base dugout. Just saw it on him and closed on him and swung him down. <laughs> so the thing is, Dr. Oma tried to get up to go and he fell back down. <laughs> now, I'll let him tell his version, but my version is the truth. <laughs> First of all, Doc, you weren't there when I tackled Chief Nakahoma, all right? <laughs> Secondly, Joe Torrey got pissed off about it. So here's the thing. We went down to Atlanta in the old stadium down there, and every game they had this guy named Chief Nakahoma. He would do a war dance on the mound, and then he would sprint down the third baseline. He had a teepee set up down in the left field bleachers, okay? So they had this war dance thing going on every game. So for three or four years there, we went down there about three times a year back then. So about nine games a year, I had to watch this guy do his war dance and sprint down the third baseline. So I said to myself one of those days, I said, you know, I'm going to clothesline this dude one day. I'm getting tired of this bitch running down our third baseline right in front of our dugout. So. It was right before the game, too. I mean, it was like right before they took the mound and started warming up for the top of the first. So finally, one day, I was standing in the dugout, and I had about three or four, maybe five years in the league. And <sighs> so Chief Nagahoma had that the war dance going on around the mound, and he started to sprint down the third baseline, and I broke from the far end of the third base dugout and ran on a line right at him. He was going this way and I was coming over here like this. And I came right up to him and I was going to clothesline him, but right at the last minute I, I said, I'm not going to really clothesline this guy. So I just got over there and just kind of pulled him down like this. <laughs> and then everybody made a big deal about it and think that I you know, hit the guy like I was tackling him. In. No way. No. I was there. What he said is right. We were all out running our sprints before the game, and we were all down the third baseline, and John says, I'm knocking his ass off. 
And he did that little tomahawk thing. He took off down the line, and John drilled him. I mean, drilled him. <laughs> he did. I mean, got him good. Now, does that ring a bell? He got him good. Next question. Yes. Buzz. Buzz. We gotta wake Buzz up sometimes. So. My memory of Pedro, Bob, you know, he's dead. You know, he passed away. Anyway. <laughs> no, we had a little. You know, uh, we were playing Cincinnati, and there was a. I forget what it was. Since they was getting beat pretty good, and Pete Rose, I guess, wanted to get things stirred up, so he came in hard at second base and hit Buddy pretty hard. And there was some words said. And he slammed Buddy down the ground. Of course, everybody started going. There was a big pile up out there. And of course, Piggy, he's got the gate wide open right away. He's ready to fight. You know, Brooklyn guy. So we got to go. Here we go. And I'm one of the smallest guys, of course. Buddy and I were probably the two smallest guys on the field. So by the time he get there, things seem to be settling down a little bit. I'm kind of circling around. And here comes Boy Bo, and he comes around on the right side. And I couldn't stop. And all of a sudden, I see something coming from over here. And he hits, punches me in the ear and knocks my hat off. And uh, Duffy was there. And he had him around the neck. And I got about three good shots in. And we're wrestling around the ground. And we get wrestled to the ground, blah, blah. And Willie come out there, peeled Peeled me off the ground. They weren't going to mess with him, so I got my shirt pulled out and everything, and we're going back, and we're finally getting it settled down. And uh, for Ball, <clears throat> in, in all the melee and stuff, in his rage, he picks my hat up, a New York hat, puts it on his head. <laughs> and so they're walking off the field, and he, the guy points one of his players, his teammates, points to the hat, and he, he takes it off. He started ripping that thing with his mouth and he tore it up with like about three pieces and, and he threw it on the ground and whatever and um, so I sent the clubhouse boy out there, where's my hat, you know, and it was all ripped up and, and I still have that hat. Many of you guys in New York, uh, I'll take some bids on it if you'd like to have it as a souvenir. A little series. I knew it ended up in Buzz trying to make money on this thing. So. <laughs> Next quest, yes. Okay, Al. Al had to go pee. <laughs> you know when you get that age, when you gotta go, you gotta go. So. Yep. I was gonna ask about the playing for Casey's thing, but I'll turn over Ron's hand. Okay. Question was for everybody in here, what was it like playing for Gil Hodges? Well, actually, I played for Casey Stengel and Gil Hodges. My rookie year was 1965, and Casey uh, ran me out there to play a little bit. My first at-bat in the big leagues was against Don Drysdale, and I was sort of surprised. Yeah, um, you can imagine this. I'm, I'm in the big leagues on a lark, okay? They kept four of us first-year players in the big leagues because that's how they maintained your contract. They could keep other teams from drafting you, Back then there was a rule that allowed it so they, they could prevent that by keeping you in the big leagues. The, the Mets lost a center fielder, one of the best center fielders of his time, Paul Blair, was drafted by the Orioles because they did not protect him. Uh, Paul died a couple of weeks ago, was in my estimation one of the top two or three center fielders of his time. So they overreacted and they kept me and Tug McGraw in the big leagues. Um, and so there were two other guys there. So I got the hit off of Don Drysdale opening, opening day, 1965, pinch hitting in the seventh inning, and it was a, it was a thrill. And, and and then of course playing for Gil Hodges, I had, I had always had a little bit of a problem with authority, uh, um, my stupidity and immaturity. But uh, playing for Gil Hodges was playing for a guy that never missed a trick. Never missed an inning, never let a game get ahead of him. And, and the platooning he did with that 69 team is, is about as brilliant as you can do it. Now again, we had a pitching staff that could make it happen.
You know, we had a pitching staff. With, you, you get, you're going to run Seaver, Kuzman. Uh, Nolan Ryan was on that staff. The only time he ever played in the World Series. Uh, Don Cardwell. Uh, our bullpen was Tug McGraw and, and Ron Taylor. We had a few guys. J Jim McAndrew. I mean, that was a staff, okay? But we played good defense behind a great pitching staff. But Hodges never missed anything that was going on in a game that was important for a manager to react to. And he always reacted in a good way. And we had a, we had a roster of guys that, that played all the time because he platooned and used everybody. So when you pinch hit it, you were ready to go. So, you know, that was a, that was a privilege. And the fact that I didn't have the best relationship with him was my, my mistake. But uh, he was an amazing guy, and, uh, and another thing a lot of people don't know, he was a Marine that was on Okinawa, which was some of the most ferocious fighting in World War II. My dad was a B-29 guy, a waste gunner on Tinian, but Okinawa was the worst of the worst in World War II, and, and Gil was there and never talked about it because the guys that saw that stuff, you know, when your eyes saw things they should never see, they don't talk about it too much, but, but he was... Formed, I think, somewhat by that, and I was just some clown coming up trying to play big league baseball. Thought I knew something. Um, that was all wrong. But uh, but the privilege was mine to play for that team and 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 for Hodges while I did. All right, Piggy. Before you got here, the question was asked: Should Gil Hodges go into the belong into the Hall of Fame? I might be a little partial. <laughs> Gil Hodges belongs in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. I don't care what anybody says. He's got better stats. And the only, there was only eight teams in the league and guys that got worse stats than him are in because they played during the era that the people that were voting on the Hall of Fame knew, knew these guys. No, they didn't know Gil Hodgers. And yes, he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Amen. And, and you could put that in two categories. Player and a man, manager. I never met a man that knew so much about the game of baseball than he did. And he, I got guys up here to prove it. He taught, he taught them how to play and what to do and how to do it. And we took a ball club in 69 that were a bunch of young kids and went to the World Series. Now, if that's not Hall of Fame caliber, then none of the none of none of us should have been in there. I mean, well, I'm not in it, but the Seaver and the Kuzmin or whoever, Nolan Ryan, none of us should be in it. If this man does not get into the Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Yes. My question is for Duffy Dyer. Okay. Who did you like to catch? Who did you hate to catch and why? Who did you like to catch? Who did you hate to catch and why? Um, I love to catch Tom and Jerry, obviously. They were uh, both great pitchers. Uh, cartoon characters, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you only caught once or twice a week, you loved catching anybody. It was just a privilege to catch that staff, especially uh, they were a bunch of great arms. 
We had a mixture of young pitchers that didn't know a whole lot about pitching but had great stuff mixed in with some veteran pitchers that had lost a lot of stuff but knew how to pitch. And the older pitchers really helped the younger pitchers as far as learning how to pitch. And what Piggy didn't mention was about Gil was he chose a great coaching staff. Uh, the coaches, and a lot of managers in baseball don't allow their coaches to do their job sometimes. They are in such control that they want to be in charge of everything and they don't let their coaches do a lot of the jobs they should. But Gil, uh, he let the coaches do what they needed to do and uh, he had trust and faith in the coaching staff and uh, you know that helped all of us. Piggy and Yogi and Rube Walker all being former catchers, they helped uh, the pitching staff and the catchers. They, uh, I owe a great deal of uh, of uh, thanks to, to Joe and uh, they just did a great job of teaching. They weren't only there to hit fungos and to try to keep you motivated in that. They, uh, they taught the game to us younger players and uh, that had a lot to do with Gil Hodges and, and, and picking his coaching staff. But uh, it was a pleasure to catch anybody on that staff. A guy that was fun to catch was Tug because Tug could make hitters look silly. I mean, he didn't have great stuff. He had the great screwball, but he could jam hitters with that mediocre fastball because they're sitting on the screwball, and he'll throw a couple fastballs. Now they're thinking fastball, and he threw that great, oh, what a uh, screwball he had. And uh, it was fun catching him. You could catch him with a, it was like catching with a pillow. Uh, he, his ball was real soft. The tough guy to catch, believe it or not, that I hated, well, I didn't hate it, but Ron Taylor had a hard sinker. I mean, in most sinker balls, they tear up your hand. It's like catching a shot put for some reason. They're very heavy. And if you caught Ron for an inning or two, I guarantee your hand would be swollen the next day. His ball was so heavy. So it wasn't a lot of fun catching him because of that. But uh, that was a great staff, and it was a pleasure to catch him. Yes. Um, the best outing that I ever had, the most memorable outing that I ever had, because I think the five times I can remember the best stuff I ever had, I got roped. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that one of the most memorable times Todd just reiterated in my ears, uh, we were playing the Phillies, and, um, I picked off two guys on first base in the same inning with the third to first move. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Unbelievable. I mean, it was great. I mean, and it won the game for us. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. I guess all in all, my most memorable time was probably 98 when I, I threw, I think it was, I don't know. I thought it was nine games in a row, but Nemo said it might have been 13. I don't know. Something ridiculous like that. But I threw a, a bunch of games in a row. And uh, most guys thought my arm was going to fall off, but truth be told, I had pretty much the whole first half of the season off because I never pitched. <laughs> so I was good to go. Okay. Wait a minute. Okay. Who would I pay to watch the bank? Nobody. We get him free. <laughs> You nuts? Who would, any of you guys pay to go now? Yeah, we all got those gold cards, so we don't have to pay it. Right, who, what player um, would you pay to go see today? Matt Harvey. Matt Harvey. Yeah. Who? Pedroia. Dustin Pedroia. Anybody else? Derek Jeter. Don't boo me. I just asked a question. Oh, Kershaw. Yeah. He can pitch. Oh, wait a minute. It's all coming out now. Okay. 
Who we got? Kershaw. Okay. Kershaw. Nice talking to you, Buzz. <laughs> Ricky Bones. Yeah. Hey, Rod. <laughs> Trout. Mike Trout. Mike Trout. Matt Harvey. Matt Harvey. Yeah. I stay home. <laughs> stay home. Okay. <laughs> Yes. I just want for Randy Neiman. You know, we talk about the World Series, but Game Six against the Astros. Some of your emotions in the bullpen. You think you might have to pitch in what I know is like the, one of the greatest games I've ever seen. All right, the emotions that Randy Neiman had, and he's a very emotional person. <laughs> game Six against Houston, right? How are you feeling? Oh my God, the emotions. Well, first of all, um, I got to warm up about four times in that game. And every time I warmed up, Davey looked down and he went, nah, that's not going to work. Let's get somebody else in there. <laughs> but, uh, no, it was, uh, I don't know if you've ever been in, 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 in that kind of an atmosphere. I mean, elimination games are emotional to start with. And then, you know, to go the extra innings and then to have it extended like that and then have them take a lead and then we tie it up and then come back and win the game. It was, it was, uh, it was a little ridiculous. And I think, uh, I think it was probably let out on the plane flight back, as you all have read about now. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was quite a deal. So hope that answers your question. <laughs> By the way, the answer about paying to see somebody and I know he's not a Met, but I got the opportunity to see Dustin Pedroia. You guys would not believe this guy. He is unbelievable. He is small, as you know, but he is talented. And this guy has a drive that you see very rare in the game. And it's one of the reasons he's won the MVP. And I was impressed. And it's, you know, I've seen a lot of great players played with a lot of great players, but this guy probably impressed me more than anybody I've ever been around. Oh. Thanks, Nemo. Yes, sir? <laughs> Wally, tell us about playing for Davey. Well, number one, we won the last world championship with this guy. Great guy. I was just with Davey this last weekend. Davey believed in his players. We had fun on the field, off the field. But when we came to the ballpark, we came there for one reason, that was to win. But Davey is, I played for a lot of great managers. My first manager was Joe Torrey. Played for George Bamberger. Davey Johnson, Frank Howard. I mean, I could go on, Jim Leland. I played Blue Pinella. But Davey was a guy that uh, didn't really care what you did as long as you came to the field to play. And that's what the 86 team did. We did it probably from 84 through 88. But the one thing that people don't understand is everybody says that, you know, we should have won another championship. And maybe we should have. If they would have had the playoffs the way they are now with wildcard teams, we would have. Because in 85, we had, we had the second, next best record in baseball. So, you know, with that being said, Davey is the guy that really gave me my opportunity to play. We had to trade Dougie Flynn so I could play. But we finally did that, but Dougie, gold glover, what can you say, you know? I mean, so, but Davey was a great guy to play for. Thanks, Mike. Yes. Okay.
All right. Let me see if I can remember all that. Um, you want Skype? Then can, okay. When, when is it uh, for pitchers? Uh, when is a good time to start throwing a curveball? And uh, where's Pete Shurik? Well, come here. Stand up and say, I don't know. You know, left-handers will always be left-handers. Pete had a good curveball. Did you throw a curveball when you were younger? I did. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> I started throwing a curveball pretty young. And uh, in the course of my career, I had four elbow surgeries. Was it, for, was it because of the curveball? Who knows? Um, I currently teach some younger kids, and all the dads and the moms constantly ask me that. I mean, there's no real scientific study that the actual curveball is that much bad than anything else throwing overhand. I mean, this is an unnatural motion. You're going to put strain on your arm. And I think overall, genetics has, you know, most to do with it. You can protect and protect and protect and protect, and then he throws one bad pitch and it hurts, and then, you know, so. I mean, that's just my opinion. I, st I started throwing when I was 10, 11, 12, and I threw a lot when I was in Little League, but, you know, who's to say that that was the, uh, the, the reason behind it? I recommend long toss. I recommend, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I recommend just trying to throw an, an overhand curve. It seems a little more stable than, you know, a slider or something like that. But um, with the kids, um, with the kids, I would suggest a lot of long toss, get their arms as loose as possible, and, uh, really work on a straight changeup. I mean, it's the best pitch in the game. Anybody that has a changeup can stay around forever. So, yeah, there you go. That answer? Okay. Next? Yes? For the 2000 guys, right, for the 2000 team. The 2000 team? Okay. Should Piazza charge the mound during the World Series? Yeah! Which one wants it? Should Piazza have charged the mound? Yes. And the only reason, I, I'm, we're going to say, the only reason I didn't charge the mound, because I thought he was going to do it. You know what I mean? And if I charge it, then what happens? We're screwed, because we only had two catchers, right, John? I wanted to whip his ass. <laughs> I say no doubt as well. And the thing that made me mad is if if I would have thrown the bat, if Jeter broke a bat and threw it at him, I would have been kicked out of the damn game. trying to win you know I mean I mean we're trying to win you know that's the bottom line now you all of a sudden you add another base runner that's not you know, I mean repercussion is not there it was it was a close game I mean you didn't we're, we were trying to beat the Yankees all right I don't think that would have answered what, what should have happened it should have been took those two guys should have fought both kicked out everything's over you know what I mean we're trying to win it's one thing that we can always talk about it armchair quarterback whatever you want to talk about it but we had to win. So you just had another guy on base, and that lineup was sick. You know what I mean? Don't get me wrong. That team was good. But we were just as good. If we would have did that, I don't think it would have answered what Roger did. It would have put us in a weaker position. The question is, what's the biggest difference between today's players 
and when we play. And I think most of us will agree on the same thing. Well, I think that today's players are bigger, stronger, and have more talent than we did to an extent. I don't, I'm not saying they're better than we were, but I think, I think that today's players, like in basketball, they're all bigger, stronger. Football, they're bigger and stronger. And baseball is evolving, you know, into a, a, where the athletes are better. I'm not saying that they're better baseball players, though. So, you know, I think that uh, back in our day, uh, you had a few pitchers throwing 95 to 100. Now a lot of them do. Uh, we had, uh, you know, we, we didn't play. It's, it's a bigger game now. You're on TV. Everybody's on TV. And uh, I just think that the players today maybe don't get after it as much as we did because they're making so much money. And we had to earn our money back then. So overall, that's it. Okay, uh, Eric Kilman. You know, to, to elaborate on that point, I think the difference really with today's players is, and I can't paint with a, with a large brush here, but I think they just don't have a lot of respect for the players that did come from the past. I'm talking about 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, when, I was in, when, when I was in Colorado and I was doing the FSN and doing the pre and post game show there, I got, uh, uh, the Dodgers came to town, this, uh, to town in 2006. Eddie Murray was the hitting coach for the LA Dodgers. I hadn't seen Eddie since uh, two, uh, 1994 because I went to Japan and played over there for a while. I hadn't seen him for a long time. I'd been out of ball. I went up and said hello and we, we kind of reconnected, chatted a little bit and I said, Eddie, how is it? How? And Jeff Kent was actually uh, on that team at the time. And uh, I asked Eddie, I'm like, how are things? You know, how, how's it, how is it? You know, being a coach, what's it like? And he's like, you know, these guys, he goes, he, he's like, Hilly, these guys just, they're uncoachable. It's different. Things have changed. Uh, Tim Bogart told me the same thing. He's in coaching now. I think he's the, uh, the bench coach for the uh, Texas Rangers this year. In fact, they, it, this was in September of 06. And, uh, you know, the, the, the rosters had expanded. And anybody who, who knew Eddie Murray or watched him or, or played with him, they knew he took the worst batting practice ever because all Eddie wanted to do was work on things. All he wanted to do was try to flare the ball and just work on, the, you know, hitting the ball the other way, whether he was hitting left-handed or right-handed. And one of the guys that he pointed out, I'm not going to name names, one of the guys he pointed out during spring training, you know, Eddie was working with him, hitting, working with him in the cage and, and whatnot, and... And he was trying to just teach him how to, you know, keep your hands in and try to drive the ball the other way. Well, this kid was young, strong, arrogant, and all he wanted to do was see how far he could hit the ball during batting practice. The guy said that the guy was getting frustrated, frustrated with Eddie Murray. And he kind of took out, you know, and he's like, and he, he said to Eddie, he goes, do you spend any time? Did you get, did you get some time in the big leagues? Do you know what you're Did you play in the big leagues? That's what he said to Eddie. So, you know, if you knew Eddie, Eddie was like, yeah, you know, I, I played a little bit. He goes, you know, in fact, something, I had a pretty, I had a, he, he's a, he said, I had a pretty unique career. It only happened to four other guys in the, in the history of major leagues. Only happened to four other guys in the big leagues. He goes, you should Google me. Look me up. He goes, look, look me up. Look me up at lunch and get back to me. And this guy was just young and arrogant. He comes back and finds out that Eddie Murray is one of only four players to hit 500 home runs, have over 3,000 hits in baseball. And it was humbled by it. And then Eddie said, now, now are you effing ready to listen to me and what I have to say? And so I think it's just a lack of, it's a lack of respect, you know, you, for, for the game and all the people that have come before you and, and paved the way for you to, to make the salaries and have the lifestyle that is afforded to you these days. Very well said. Bobby Wine, what was the, what was the minimum your first year? Six thousand dollars. Rocky? Five thousand? Six thousand? Piggy? Four thousand? Five thousand? AJ? Dude? Fifteen thousand? Felix? Six thousand dollars? I'm afraid to ask some of you other guys. <laughs> Turk? My, my feeling is a lot of the players today that, that change the game is they, A, they don't even wear their uniforms the right way anymore. 
B, B, they don't play because they love the game. They play for fame and they play for money. And that's it. Good. Duffy. I also feel that uh, when we played, the managers and the coaches and the owners ran the game. The players didn't have a whole lot to say about it because thank God we got a players union going and went on strike a few times and, and got some things for us. But today, the players run the game. I'll guarantee it made Don Mattingly sick to watch play, play, play all year. And he couldn't do a damn thing about it because the guy is such a star and a stud. I'll bet Mattingly wasn't real happy with it, but again, the players are running the game now. i tell you what I would like to know. Why is the most dangerous thing in Major League Baseball to hit a walk-off, base hit, or a home run? That's the most dangerous thing you can do, and your own teammates will break your ankle, beat you on the head, chase you around the diamond. Why does that happen? Who, who, who invented that? Who does that? Huh? Who does that? Well, we, I mean, we'd like to see a lot of walk-off hit, but it's strange stuff like that. I've seen more guys hurt in that pseudo-celebration after you win a ball game. Act like, you know, I remember when somebody said, act like you did it before. You know, act like it's happened before. But I, but I do, that one bothers me only because ball players are pretty expensive. And to have a guy that's important to you, who does a big thing in a game, get beat up and bashed around because he won the ball game for you, that makes about zero sense to me. But, but I mean, you know, I, John Stearns managed the, tri I, I do some work for the AAA team in New Orleans. We're the Miami Marlins AAA affiliate. John Stearns came to town and he was, he had become their manager because they had some organizational moves and the manager there went to the big leagues for a while as the third base coach. John Stern did something I haven't seen in so long. He got his team, Tacoma, on the field and oh my God, they took infield and outfield before a game. They took infield and outfield and they had those outfielders throwing to bases and catching ground balls and working on double plays before a baseball game. You don't even see that at the triple-A level anymore. John Stearns did it. You're never going to see it at the big league level. So I'm just saying, there's, there's, there's something about this game right now. And these are great, you know, they are great athletes. But they're almost like if I could, you know, the only thing they're going to, the only place you're going to find these guys is down in the hitting cage. Hitting, you know, taking 150, 200 swings before a ball game. There's a little bit more to baseball than what's going on in that hitting cage. I'm not saying it's unimportant, but there's some other things to the game. And the teams that do it right do win World Series. The teams that know how to play the game do win World Series. I hated those beards in Boston. Hated them. But I love their intensity, and I love the way that team plays, and I love the way Pedroia gets out there, and the way they got after it. And how long did it take, how long did it take a pretty damn smart team out of, out of St. Louis to figure out you better stop throwing big poppy strikes. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> I just didn't get it. That was the strangest World Series I've ever seen. Um, strange. But the right team won. Ha! Can I get an amen? Amen! Thank you. Preach it, Rocky. Uh, yes. Wally Backman. What was it like platooning with Tim Tuffle, and what is your relationship with him? Timmy and I are great friends, and, and the first year that Timmy came there, and we platooned, I hit 320, so it wasn't all bad. <laughs> they got me a good contract for three years. But no, platooning is, as a player, you don't, you don't want to do it. You want to play every day. And the older I got, and the few years that Timmy and I did it together, you realize if you put those numbers together, what Timmy and I did in 86 when we actually won the World Series, we had 40-some doubles. We had 90-some RBIs, 20 home runs, 40 stolen bases. If you put all that stuff together, 
And, and yeah, when I was playing, no, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. But when you put those numbers together, you go, now that I manage in Vegas for the Mets, I go, I'd like to have that player again. And it could be two of them. But, you know, it's, it's when you really think about winning, what it takes to win, and you can put your whole mind and, and, and body and soul into this all about winning, you can, you can, you can, you can handle it. You can understand it. And, and that's kind of the, the, the thing that Timmy and I did. You know, we realized that, yeah, he wanted to play. You know, I was fortunate because I got to face all the writings so that one every five days I'd get a rest. It's kind of like a pitcher in a way. You, I knew I'd have a rest, but, but uh, no, it was, I understood it. And, and, and even though neither one of us probably liked it, we understood that it made our team better. Raleigh's one of those guys that always got it. When he came up as a young kid, he understood he had respect for the game and respect for those in front of him, and that's why he played 14 years in the big leagues. And we were talking a few minutes ago, there's even kids he's managing right now, and they ask him if he ever played. I mean, that's stupid. Yes. <laughs> How many years has Piggy been in baseball? Or were you in baseball? I guess you still are. And who is the best pitcher that he has ever seen? Colfax. Gibson. Drysdale. There's a whole, there's a whole lot of them. A whole lot of them. Mary Shell, another one. Seaver. Kuzman. I was out to eat. I could pitch. I could pitch. Bob Fowler. Cy Young. <laughs> Robin Roberts. But Robin, Robin Roberts. I gotta tell you a story about Robin Roberts. He was pitching with the Phillies, and I hit a home run off of him. And when I crossed home plate, he says, I think it's time for me to quit. I said, No, don't leave now. There was a lot of good pitches, a lot of good pitches. My God, how many years? How many years was I in the game? Oh, I, was, I, I got to say I was close to 50. No, I went to China, I went to China and let them make them for me. Right. No. Right. <laughs> well, my introduction to Casey Stingle. I was sitting on the bench with him. We're both in Met uniforms. He doesn't know who the hell I am, but he kn I knew who he was. So. Jack Ryan happened to walk by and says, who's going to catch today, Casey? He said, that picnic tiny guy if he ever gets here. <laughs> and I was talking to him for an hour. <laughs> well, I, I shouldn't say I was talking to him. He was talking to me for an hour. And when I started to play, with the team, the 62 Mets, he let me go to the bullpen. And I'd sit in the bullpen and he'd say, when the phone rings, you pick it up because I'll be on the other end. I said, yes, sir. So sure enough, in about the seventh inning, the phone rang. He said, get up, Nelson, and hung up. 
We had no Nelson. <laughs> So I got the ball and put it on the rubber. I said, Nelson. Bob Miller got up and started throwing. And I says, when the hell did you change your name? He says, I did and he did. And that's the way it went. And now he called, he called me down the bullpen one day and says, Mr. Pignatani, Please send Blanchett down to pinch it. I said, sir, Blanchett, I can't send him down to pinch it. He says, why? You don't like my choice? Oh, I said, your choice is great. But he plays for the Yankees. <laughs> this is all true. So, you know, and when he called, when he called me down and, and, and asked for Branchy to come to pinch it, I says, oh my God, you know, he's going back to his old Yankee days. But, and the old man was all right, but I think at that time, in, that stage in his life, I think he was about getting out of it. We get time for a couple more. This question is for Pete. Uh, Pete, if you just talk a little bit about your emotions of your uh, Cy Young uh, runner-up year after the stormy years with uh, Dallas and Jeff, and then uh, the, the opportunity to win the uh, opening day assignment the following year that unfortunately only lasted Seven you got all that? All right. There's a lot wrapped up in that. Um, I guess as we mo most of us know, my time in New York wasn't the most productive. Um, Mets got rid of me at the end of 93. Uh, McIlvain brought me into the office and said... Uh, we don't like your off the field habits. You quit drinking or you're gone. I said, okay. I was the worst pitcher on the worst team in the league. So I quit drinking in the off season, came up to spring training ready to go, fired up, had an okay spring. And uh, Dallas and I had some run-ins the year before. Um, he wasn't too kind with younger players, AY, hey, huh? <coughs> So he had already had it set that they were going to get rid of me. So they put me on waivers to Cincinnati, <clears throat> but I had, uh, I had turned a corner anyway. So I had a decent year in Cincinnati in, in 94. And in, okay, so then I had another really good year in 95, earned the opening day start in 96 for the Reds. And John McSherry was the umpire that day. I don't know if anybody knows the story, but I get on the mound, I'm all fired up. I just came off a great year, feeling good about the season. First opening day start, first pitch of the season, boom, right down the middle. And he just stands there. I'm like, holy crap, this is gonna be a long season. <laughs> So next pitch is blowing away, something like that. Now all of a sudden, everything is a strike, right? Strike, strike, strike. And all of a sudden, after uh, seven pitches, I guess it was, he waves, he motions out like this. And I didn't know if he was talking to me or who he was talking to. I looked behind me to the second base umpire. And when I turned back, he was about three or four steps to the tunnel behind home plate in Cincinnati and just collapsed and died right on the spot. So uh, there you go. Um, Mark Schott wanted to continue the game, of course. <laughs> it, was her, it was her only sellout of the year. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we all had a big discussion in the locker rooms. Uh, after the incident and everything, and we just felt it was right to 
to cancel the game. But on a side note, the year before we were playing um, the Montreal Expos, and that was the year Pedro Martinez threw at Reggie Sanders' head during a perfect game, and Reggie Sanders charged him in like the sixth inning. But Pedro had that had that reputation of throwing at guys' heads, and nobody was having it. So we charged him, and then, uh, I don't know, a month later, we faced Pedro again. I'm pitching. I drill Pedro, right? And... <laughs> All right. Nice big welt. Nice big welt on his elbow. <laughs> no, not at all. That was the only one on purpose that I owned up to. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but later, that was a little later in the game, so um, I had already had my bat or whatever the, the situation was. Um, I didn't have to go back up to bat. <laughs> so, so we didn't face each other, and then he goes to Boston from Montreal, and then a year or two later, I go to Boston from Houston. And the first thing he says to me when I walk into the locker room, he goes, you got lucky. I was like, what are you talking about, dude? He's like, I was going to drill you in the head on opening day in 1996. <laughs> but the umpire passed away. <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry, bro. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. We're we'll going to take that time for one more. Yes, sir. Rod? Does anybody on the 85 team have any memories about the first game of the 85 team about something that happened in 80? 85. How many innings did we play? How many innings did we play? 19? I know they shot the fireworks at about 4 o'clock in the morning. There was about 10 people in the stands. The best pitcher we had, I believe, was Tom Gorman, who pitched the first inning and only gave up a couple of runs because everybody else, they were bad. And I know I had to play all 19 innings. There was a few ejections, but it was a long game, exciting game, and the best part about it was we won the game. Doug, are you going to eat? Are you going to do that first? Or are you going to eat first? All right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have. Uh, we got food in the back, so we're going to.